Luke chapter 17 is, of course, uh, right smack in the middle of the Gospel of Luke. And the book of Luke wrote so that we would know that Jesus was a man. And he was the man in Luke. It's written by a, a physician. It's one of the longest books of our New Testament, Luke and the book of Acts, one of the longest uh, in words. He was very wordy, very detailed, very, um, he had done a lot of research whenever God uh, let him put this into, into the Holy Writ. And I'm very thankful for the book of Luke. Here he tells a story of Jesus in his life. And he tells him as he's making his disciples and they're going and they're going to pass through Samaria and Galilee. And I want to talk to you tonight a little bit about the Christian's view of appreciation or uh, gratitude. I think it's a missing element. It's probably one of the worst sins a person can commit. From the sin of ingratitude and a failure to be thankful, all kinds of other perverse activities take place. I believe it's a sin I commit. Many of us, we complain incessantly. We've got something we cry about all the time. We live in a great place. We have wonderful opportunities as Americans, as Christians. We have eternal life. We have Jesus Christ as our Lord, and yet we still complain. A lack of gratitude, a lack of appreciation. It's very common, but it's very wicked. I want us to look at tonight a story that Jesus saw, and he was very frustrated. And you would be frustrated too if you loved people like Jesus did. And he helped people. He's with his disciples and he's taking his time as he comes through two areas of Samaria and Galilee. And let's look at it. Can you look at it with me? If you have your Bible, let me encourage you to open it up right now and look at it. I know we're not in the auditorium. But wherever you may be, let's have the character and the, uh, the consciousness to take our Bible. Look at it. We read it with Brother Colston, but it's important we see what God has for us. And I'm burdened about this particular message. I think you're going to hear a lot better messages in time to come from many other people about gratitude, but I don't think you'll hear one that's any more important than tonight. I think we need it. I think we need it right now in this time when uh, we have reasons to be frustrated with this decision or this inability or I can't get in this location or I can't do what I normally do, and we ought to be a grateful people. And God's been good to us. But here's the story. Look at verse number 11, would you please? Luke chapter 17. And it came to pass as he went to Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. He's coming from the northern part of Israel, making his way to Jerusalem, and he's coming through two areas of Galilee and Samaria. And then of course, your, ge your uh, geography there is a little area between, uh, on the, uh, as you look at Israel on the western shore, in the middle of the, of, the, of the country is Samaria. And those are people that were Jews, married in with the Assyrians, and they didn't like each other. They didn't accept them in their worship, so they had their own form of worship. They had their own way of doing things. And Jesus walks right in the middle of those things, not where probably the disciples enjoyed, but he was trying to tell them. Because he would later tell them, standing on the Mount Olive, he would tell them, but you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you'll be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and in Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. Let me just tell you something, just remind you. God loves people more than anything. And He loves all kinds of people. And He's doing a work in this world. And if you see somebody, they have a different skin color, a different ethnic background, a different social status than you, and we have prejudice that, that, that creep up in our pride, we ought to knock it off real quickly. And realize that God loves everybody. He cares about them. Red, yellow, black, and white, they're all precious in His sight. And we need to say, you know what, it is pride, it is sin. One thing we know about God is that He is not a respecter of persons. Are you? Am I? I am. Sometimes I just, uh, I've got that sin in me. I've got that, that judgmental thought. I think I'm better than somebody else. Well, I don't bother people like they bother people. I don't have that same uh, attitude. You know how some people are just jerks. Some people are just, you know what, sometimes I'm the jerk. Sometimes you're the jerk. Well, I, you know how they people are. You know, I'm not so care about that. 
Why did that guy have that? Hey, he's a man. He's dressed up like a, he's got like a dress on. You know, all those things, those perceptions that we saw even just a few moments ago, oftentimes skew our, our view of what God's trying to do. And I think Jesus put it in their face many times. And it needs to be put in my face, in your face, uh, that we are not supposed to be a respecter of persons. I think one of the strengths of maturity is, is learning how to treat people with, equi with equitable ways. And it's my problem and your problem. May God help us with that. But Jesus takes the disciples right down on the border of those two places. Let's look at verse number 12. The Bible says, And he entered into a certain village, and there met him ten men that were lepers, which stood afar off. They were isolated. They were quarantined. They began with a, a sore on their hand or their forehead or their head. And people feared this disease. It was the worst. There was no cure for it. Their only cure was a miracle. It's what they had to have. You know, it's a beautiful thing. Uh, in the book of Leviticus, that's hard reading right there. But the book of Leviticus, chapters 13 and 14, they are probably... They're probably in the top 10 of the two longest chapters in our Bible. And uh, yet they're all about how to treat a leper, how to help a leper, how, what the rules of leprosy are all about. And you know what? The only way you can get done with leprosy, there was no known cure. It was going to be God healing you. But you know, God was good at doing this. He did this often. In Luke chapter 5, I believe that's the chapter Jesus touched a man, touched a leper. That was something you didn't do. He touched the leper. But here, these ten men came and they saw Jesus. And there he is in that certain village. They see him and they say, Jesus, Master, have mercy upon us. They're far off and, and they, they see Jesus. They recognize him. This is toward the end of his ministry. So they have seen him probably and heard about his miracles. As they see him walking with the disciples, maybe one of them, maybe several of them said, that's Jesus, that's the miracle man, that's the, the perceived Messiah. Some believe that he's really the Christ. But whatever it was, though they had a distance from each other, they cried out, said, Jesus, Master, would you have mercy upon us? Notice what Jesus said. Look back in your Bible, would you please? Look at chapter 17. They lifted up their voices. They prayed. That was the prayer that was prayed. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go show yourself unto the priest. And it shall come to pass that it, as they went, and it came to pass as they went, they were cleansed. This is interesting. The priest was not a medical professional, but he had been given Lew, or Leviticus 13 and 14. If you were going to be relieved from, if you thought you had leprosy, you went to the priest. And the priest had to isolate or quarantine you. We see several people. Miriam had leprosy. Uzziah had leprosy. Several people, the, uh, the, 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 little, the, the little helper for Elijah, he uh, got uh, leprosy for the rest of his life for lying and stealing or taking money that didn't belong to him and clothes that he shouldn't have had. You remember the story. It was a terrible disease. It was a, it was a death knell in you. You knew you were going to die if you had leprosy. Well, these men knew that, but they saw Jesus. They hoped for a miracle. One of the difficult things about leprosy was not only that you had a death pronouncement upon you, but you were isolated from your family. You were isolated from people, from people you worked. And, and we don't have leprosy here, friends, but one thing that this coronavirus has done, it has created distance. You know, I am so tired of doing the chicken wing bump here. You know, I'm tired of just doing this or, hey, how you doing? I, I'm awkward. I want to just shake hands. I want to hug some people and say, hey, I miss you. But it's been an isolation. Many of you have been in your homes at the stay-at-home orders and you've not been out and about. And, and it's very wise for many of you to be very careful. But these men, this was their future. They had no end in sight. You and I, we have end in sight. I believe the Lord is going to help us again, get back to normal real soon. But for these men, there was no end in sight, but they cried out to the Lord. And the Lord said, go show yourself to the priest. 
When they would go to show themselves to the priest, the priest had a protocol. You can read about it. It's kind of boring reading, and I don't think I'm disrespectful to the Lord on that, but I read Le Leviticus 13 and 14, and I'm, it's, a, it's confusion. I'm glad I don't have to do it today as a, as a representative of God. But they had to, vi to see, did they have it? They were proclaimed and isolated from them. Then if, they, if they got healed, they had to come and show them. And then they were isolated again, quarantined for seven days to make sure that it didn't come back or make sure it was actually done. And then if they were cured, they had to shave all their hair off their head, their eyebrows, their beard completely to prove that. And then they were later pronounced in a public setting that they are now cured from leprosy. Well, these men said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Jesus said, go show yourself to the priest. And as they turned to walk away from Jesus... After he yelled that to them at a distance, the Bible says that they were cleansed. The sore on their head, the sore in their hands, it went away. And they were cleansed. They, they, they realized what had happened. Something miraculous had just taken place. Some of them, no doubt, maybe were at different stages, were losing sensitivity in their hands, and now it comes back. Maybe something had lost fingers or, or lost uh, appendages someplace or, and, and they could tell that this was attacking their body. Now they knew something had happened and it happened to all 10 of them. You know, I want to just say real quickly as I think about this story, I want us to understand something about God. He doesn't do the same thing in every situation. That sometimes bothers me. I would like to think that every time I witnessed someone, every time they got saved, they cried, they were repentant, everything was the same. But you know, that's not been the case. God works with different people in different ways. And you know what we need to do? Get used to it. <laughs> Get used to it that God doesn't fit everything in the same box. At one leper, he touches him in the early parts of Luke. This one, he just yells at them, go show yourself to the priest. Some blind men, he... Uh, he just spits on their eyes. He spits in their eyes. Sometimes he makes a mud pie and puts that on his eyes. He does things differently. I don't know why. That's why he's God. <laughs> he doesn't have to tell me why. He doesn't owe me anything, even an explanation. But I think it's a good idea for all of us to realize this. The, the just shall live by faith. I like things to be the same. Many of you are just like me. This, one of the most frustrating things about this whole situation is that it takes us out of our comfort zone. We like certain things the same way. We like going to sit in the same place in the auditorium. If someone sits in your seat, it really bothers you for the rest of the service. You know who I'm talking about. You're that way, I'm that way. We get used to a routine, and we like it the same way. Some of the folks in the choir sit in the same place. Some of them, nah, they're, they're a little bit loosey-goosey about that. It doesn't matter so much. We like having an order of service, and we like things to be structured. May I say to you that God doesn't have to bring people to Christ in a regular church service. I think He uses that, and I can't wait to get back to it. But quite frankly, friend, God does different things in different seasons, in various manners, in different generations. I need to accept that. You need to accept that. God's not marching to the beat of our drum. We should be marching to the beat of His drum. And His drum sometimes might be a little faster. Sometimes it might be a little slower. He might put the brakes on your life and say, Hey, listen, why don't you sit and have a little more gift of time to read your Bible, to learn to pray, to learn to depend upon me, to have a little bit of solace about you. These are some things we need to learn about God. And I see this in this passage of Scripture. We see something else happens. And the Bible tells us that... Ten men were healed of leprosy, but only one man was made whole. And I don't know if that's a salvation situation. I'm not sure how the analogy works here, but the Bible tells us that one man came back. As he was running away to the priest, he saw the things on his hands, and he saw that he was good. He might have felt the energy from within, and he goes, I'm healed. I'm healed. And before he goes to the, the priest, he turns around and he runs back to Jesus. Now there is no social distancing. Now, now there's no reason for him to yell. He comes right to his feet and he falls at his feet and he worships the Lord. He glorifies him. He gives him thanks. Let's look what the Bible says in chapter 17. 
And now we're looking at verse number 15. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God. And he fell down on his face at his feet. Can I ask you, friend, when's the last time you fell down on your face? When's the last time you got on those knees? You may not be able to do it physically, but if you still can bow the knee, let me encourage you to do it. He fell down on his face. He was grateful. He was very thankful and gave, he giving him, giving Jesus thanks. And the Bible says he was a Samaritan. You know, something interesting there. Whenever you're in the mess of sin, it doesn't matter what your race is. <laughs> it, you know, when they were all in that, they're all lepers. They're all bitten with a death, a death pronouncement. They're going to be exiled the rest of their life. They're going to be isolated. They're just going to watch each other die. It didn't matter if they were Samaritan or Jew. It didn't matter if they were Greek or Jew. And by the way, I'm glad that the same Lord over all is rich to all that call upon Him. But here, the Bible tells us He was a Samaritan. The Jews, maybe just because they knew more about the priest situation, they, they, they wanted to go quickly. Maybe they couldn't wait to start that seven-day quarantine to get back to the family. And the, new, the closer they get back, the more they could be reconciled with their wife or their children or their grandchildren or their brother, their sister, their mom and their dad. I don't know. But the Bible tells us that one went back. He fell at Jesus' feet. He glorified Him and He gave thanks to the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we see the Lord Jesus' response. Would you look at it if you would please? We're looking at now at verse number 17. And Jesus answering said, Were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? What an indictment. There are not found that return to give glory to God, save this stranger, this guy who's not even... He's not even Jewish with the Lord Jesus. He's a stranger. He's outside our camp. And he said unto them, Arise, go thy way. Thy faith hath made thee whole. The word whole, another word for the word whole is saved. <laughs> you know, ten, nine were, were healed. One we know that was saved. Nine were healed physically and got the, the blessings of God upon them. We see this one. He was made whole completely because of his faith. But I will say this to you, I want to make sure if all of them in, in this story actually came to know Jesus their Savior, what group would you be in? What group would your kids say you'd be in? <laughs> what group would your family say you'd be in? Are you in the nine or in the one? Are you a grateful servant of Christ? Are you someone that looks and sees the blessings of God? Or you see criticism? Do you see negative? Do you see the, 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 the frustrations? When someone looks at you, when someone listens to you for just a few minutes, are they glad to hear you talk? And are they more inspired and encouraged? The Bible tells us, let no corrupt communication proceed out of our mouth, but that which is good for the use of edifying, building up. Many of us, we've got problems. We've got a corrupt conversation. We complain and frustrate. And let me tell you something, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Do you think you deserve better than you have? Do I think I deserve better than I have? Do I think I've gotten a, a, a really a bad shake at life? That God has not been good to me or He's not been good to you? Dear friend, I think we ought to really evaluate this. But where are the nine? God has been good to every one of us. He's been good to you if you're listening to my voice. And I don't care what country you live in. God's been good to you. He's provided for us eternal life. He's provided for us help for everyday life. And yet many times we spend our times living so low and so frustrated and so complaining and so much in the sin of gratitude, of ingratitude. I think what Psalms 107, oh, that men would praise the Lord for His wonderful goodness to the children of men. Are you in that group that would do that? Are you someone who would say that or someone that has to say that to you? Oh, can't you find some reason to thank the Lord? Dear friend, God has been very good to us and I want to encourage you tonight, especially those who call First Baptist Church their home, especially those who call Jesus Christ our Lord. Hey, let's get a check up from the neck up. Let's make sure that we are a grateful people. Someone said when the fires of gratitude die out in the heart of a man, that man is well nigh hopeless. You want to talk about a miserable sin? You want to talk about a sin that is devastating to many lives? It's the sin of ingratitude. 
Many of us, we wouldn't put an alcohol bottle to our lip if it, if it, if it was our life dependent upon it. But we are so ungrateful. We wouldn't smoke a cigarette, but we complain terribly. Teenagers, oftentimes you complain about this, not having this, and not having this, and how come I have to get up early, and why do I have to go to school, and how come I have to do all this work, all that stuff. It's wicked. It's terrible. If you can look with me, if you would, please, and we'll conclude tonight. And by the way, I reminded of the book of Daniel in chapter 5 when, when, when uh, Belshazzar has his drunken feast. He pulls out the gold and silver from the temple and, and he goes through that and he, God begins to deal with him. And his mother said, you know, there's a guy in our, in our area. There's two things about him. He has an excellent spirit and he has an obvious testimony. By the way, that's the thing I want to have. That's all you ought to have. In your neighborhood, you ought to have an excellent spirit, an obvious testimony for Jesus and for God. And he called him. And Daniel came. He said, if you'll tell me what's going on, I'll give you all these gifts. He said, keep your gifts. But let me tell you what's going on. You've had a life testimony. Your dad, Nebuchadnezzar, he came to know the God of the Bible. He came to worship him. But God had to deal with him and deal with him for his pride. And uh, you saw it happen. And you have rejected the God that he got dealt with about. He said, you, the very breath you have in your lungs, you can read it in Daniel 5, verse 23. You have not glorified God for that. One of the things about this coronavirus is so terrible is it attacks the pulmonary uh, system of a person's body. Boy, the fact if you can take a deep breath, you ought to thank God for that. You ought to be a grateful person. He said, even the breath that God gives you, you're not, even, you're not even willing to glorify God for that. He said, as a result of that, God's going to deal with you. And God dealt with Belshazzar. He passed away. <laughs> God dealt with him. You know, God wants to deal with us too. We're not thankful. Take your Bibles in closing. Let's turn to Romans chapter 1. Thank you for turning with me. I think it's important for you to see this. If you're in the habit of underlining things in your Bible, you'll want to underline this. I'm going to read a portion of the scripture real quickly, and then I'm going to make a closing comment and we'll be done. But the sin of ingratitude, not exercising appreciation. The Bible tells us that God's wrath is revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness, and the whole world one day will be without excuse. Many people spend their time, well, what about all the people who don't know about it? What about you who, do, who does know about it? That's what I want to ask you right there. You know, God is good enough. He's not unrighteous. And the whole world will be without excuse. But he tells us here in Romans 1 how that he will save those who are in rank sin. He'll save the religious sinners in chapter 2. Everyone's a sinner in chapter 3. But he says, listen, no one's going to say, well, it wasn't fair for me. You know why? Because God revealed himself through creation. Just look around. This didn't happen through a big bang somewhere, friend. God reveals himself through conscience. In the back of your head, in your deep crevices of your heart, you know there's a God. God put his law in your heart. He said he is, he is the light that lieth every man that cometh in the world. We know he's a God because of creation. We know he's a God because of our conscience. We know there's a God because of consequences and circumstances. How many of you uh, remember maybe driving and almost wrecking? You, you don't even know how in the world you got out of that accident. You, you almost died, you know. And God helped you. You know what you thought about at that time? There's a God in heaven. That's what you thought about. He, he tells us who he is through, through creation, through conscience, through circumstances, through consequences. You thought you got by with something. It was revealed. Why? Because there's a God in heaven. Maybe he reveals himself through the calendar. Everywhere in the world is 2020 after the death of God's son and the resurrection of God's son. He reveals himself through his son, Jesus Christ. He's the image of God. He reveals himself through the canon of scripture. But he says here, I'm going I'm to tell you the, the devastating effects of failing to be grateful. Would you look, if you would please, Romans chapter 1, verse number 21. Because that when they knew God, they knew that it was a God. No one, God does not believe in atheists, okay? There are no atheists in foxholes. He said they knew there was a God, but they glorified him. They were not thankful to him. They glorified him and recognized him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. 
They professed themselves to be wise. They became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into the image made like a corruptible man and to birds and four-feeted beasts and creeping things. Let me just say something real quickly. Um, and I, I just, I think it's very good. Christians, God made the world and we have dominion over the world. But don't fall in love with your animal over the one who gave you your animal. I believe we're getting a little bit goofy out there. We're, we're worshiping the creature more than the creator. Look at your checkbook. See how much you spend on vet bills and, and, uh, and dog food and cat food and, and whatever else over what you've given to world evangelism or what you've given to the Lord. If you see a discrepancy there, you might want to be careful about that. I think it's just something. We worship the creature rather than... And when God gives you a gift, stay in love with the giver at the expense... Don't, don't fall in love with the gift at the expense of the giver. God gives you a child in your home. He gives you a wedding and, and a beautiful wife or a good husband. Listen, uh, you ought to serve God even more so because of the gift that God gave you. And I think this here, they worship the creature. Look at verse number 24. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness. After that, here's the digression. Through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies immorally between themselves who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause, God gave them up. He let them do what they're going to do to vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use of that which is against nature. Likewise, also the men leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust toward an, uh, one another. Men with men working that which is unseemly, that's homosexuality, that's sodomy, and receiving in themselves the recompense of their error, which, is, which, was, which was meat. It just goes with it. You got what you do when you do something against God's laws. And even as, uh, as they did not retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. And to be filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, um, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, and disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God that they that commit such things are worthy of death, not only to do the same, but have pleasure or entertain by them that do that. Say, so, well, I would never be a fornicator. Don't watch it on TV. <laughs> well, I, I, don't, I don't think, I, I, I wouldn't tell a joke like that, but you laugh when someone else tells that joke. You say, you know, I'd be a pleasure in those things. What we just read was a list of almost every um, uh, sin that you can do, category of sins. They're listed there. You know what the first one was? When they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful. You know, these sins are all very wicked, but they begin with an attitude of ungratefulness. Christian, I don't want that, and you don't want that. If we can just read one chapter of the Bible, we can say, man, I do not want to end up in that terrible pit of sin. By the way, aren't you glad... I think the most important verses in Romans 1 are not the ones we read. They're the verse number 15 and 16 where it says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God, the salvation of everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. It speaks that the thing that can change all of that sin is the gospel of Jesus. Are you a Christian that's thankful? Is your husband married to a grateful wife? Is your wife married to a grateful husband? Do your kids have a grateful dad and mom? Do your mom and dad have a grateful teenager that lives in their home and children who are grateful and thankful? Or do you always complain? I believe tonight God is teaching us, where are the nine? Where are those who I've been good to and they don't even take time to come back and express gratitude in everything give thanks? For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. It's the will of God. Christian, I want to encourage you to be a thankful person.